Um, we'll have now hear oral evidence from Russell Langer, head of policy of research at the Jewish Leadership Council. Welcome. And Daniel Sugarman, director of public affairs for the board of deputies of British Jews. For this session, we have until 10.25. Would the witnesses please introduce themselves for the record? Sure. I'm Russell Langer. I'm the Head of Policy and Research at the Jewish Leadership Council. And I am Daniel Sugarman. I am a Director of Public Affairs at the Board of Deputies of British Jews. Thank you. Um, now, I'd like to um, bring on the first member who might have a question, um, Wayne David. Chair, um, good morning to you both. Both your organisations support the legislation which we have before us. And I've read your, your, your submissions, and it's quite clear that you are, are supportive of the various aspects of it. But can you tell us, hand on heart, if you had a blank sheet of paper before you, would this be the approach that your organisations would be in favour of? <coughs> I judge the legislation based on whether or not it will adequately prohibit BDS in public bodies, I believe it does, uh, whether or not it covers the correct public bodies within the scope of the bill, and it does, and whether or not it has the appropriate enforcement powers to ensure that it, the bill will have the intended effect, and it does. Uh, I, I'm aware, I, I didn't draft the legislation, I saw the legislation probably similar timings of what you did. Um, but on those bases, it's something that I'm, I'm very comfortable in supporting. I would say, similarly, we, we had no role in drafting the legislation, of course. We saw it probably around the same time as, as many of you. Um, this is a policy area that we've been very interested in for quite a while now. And I think that the bill as it stands addresses the concerns that we have. Um, although, of course, if, if amendments are raised, then I'm sure we will watch them with interest, as will other people. But, but if it, be, be, it had been formal consultation with you before the, the publication of the draft legislation, are there any specific points that you would have asked to be included in legislation which you don't find before you now? No, as I said, uh, if, we, if we had... Amendments which we would propose, we would have included them in our written submission, and I don't believe either organisation has. Uh, I look forward to seeing amendments as they come with interest, and we'll consider them on their merits, but um, we're happy as it stands with the bill. Can I ask just one further one? Yeah. I mean, both organisations are in favour of a two-state solution to the uh, uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. One of the things in the legislation which is different to any other legislation I've seen from this government or any other British government, is that it, it equates the State of Israel with the occupied Palestinian territories. And it has been suggested that that very coupling, that equality of treatment, calls into question for the first time by a British government its commitment to a two-state solution. What is your view on that? Well, um, I think that we, we have to accept the circumstances as they currently are and the, the circumstances as they currently are are that there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people living beyond what one might call the Green Line. There has been already a firm understanding among different parties to peace negotiations that there will have to be land swaps in terms of the future two-state solution, which we hope and pray for. And given that that is the case, to penalise um, people who are living, essentially, there, there is a difference between hilltop settlements and um, towns essentially connected to Jerusalem where tens of thousands of people live. And I think that the way that things have worked up until now has led everything being tarred with the same brush, and I'm not sure that that's particularly helpful. If, if I can add, the, I, I disagree with your assessment that the legislation paints it all in the same way. Firstly, they clearly, Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories and the Garan Heights are listed separately on the bill, which I'm pretty sure if you were to ask the Israeli government, they would see that as it being listed separately. But more importantly, the, the government's been clear that this doesn't change UK policy. 
Um, UK policy on Israel and settlements is something that is subject uh, for, is a reserve matter for the national government and it's something that gets debated in this place on a regular basis. What we don't require is for this debate to happen in every public body around the country, especially when it usually tends to be the only foreign policy debate that happens in public bodies around this country. And I think that's the really key important part here. Uh, to me, this isn't a discussion about settlements. That is a legitimate conversation to happen in Parliament. We don't need to be having that conversation in every public body around this country. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Can you first of all set out why you think this legislation is necessary and also touch on the links between BDS campaigns and anti-Semitism? Sure. The Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions campaign, BDS, uh, against Israel is a pernicious campaign which seeks to single out the world's only Jewish state for unique treatment. As I just said in the previous answer, when we look at the picture in public bodies around this country when it comes to foreign policy discussions, Israel is the only country um, that is singled out in this way. Uh, that was something that was made clear in the House of Commons Library briefing, uh, prepared ahead of second reading as well. And therefore, I believe this legislation is necessary to end that practice of Israel being singled out in this way in public bodies around the country. In terms of the links to anti-Semitism, uh, the link between anti-Semitism here in the UK and the situation in Israel is clear. It's clear in the statistics, it's clear in the months which have had the highest levels of anti-Semitism um, on record. They all correspond to the months in which conflicts have happened in Israel. So that link is clear. What we then tend to see is at the time when the Jewish community is most vulnerable in this country, when anti-Semitism is at its highest, we see public bodies under intense pressure from campaign groups to get involved in that by uh, boycotting Israel and coming back to the point I made around that being the only time they usually ask to get involved in such foreign policy. And therefore, I believe that what this legislation does is allows public bodies such as local authorities, higher education institutions and cultural organisations to focus on improving community cohesion at a time where it's at its most it's most threatened point, and I think this legislation is helpful for that. If I might add, in terms of the links to anti-Semitism, I think that there are a few points to consider. The first is that of somewhat questionable double standards. People who seem to take an extreme interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and call for a full boycott of Israel seem rarely, if ever, to call for boycotts of any other country. It just appears to be the world's only Jewish state that gets this sort of treatment. Um, the history of boycotts against Jews is a very painful one. It links directly back to Nazi Germany, and it would be, it, it's clear that at least for a significant percentage of the community, when we hear about boycotts against Israel, that is a link that is raised. Uh, we have had cases, unfortunately, where people participating in BDS campaigns have gone beyond Israel. So, for instance, uh, I recall, I think it was a case in a, in a supermarket where a, a bunch of BDS campaigners went in and started defacing products which they felt were Israeli-linked, but of course they went straight for the kosher food section and didn't appear to distinguish, so um, that, that did send a, a rather clear signal. And I would say that, if, if I may, just two more quick points. Firstly, we have, uh, there is polling to suggest that 80%, more than 80% of British Jews see Israel as either central or important to their Jewish identity. There is a very, very strong link between the Jewish community and Israel. And when Israel and Israel alone is targeted in such a manner, it really does have a strong impact on the Jewish community. And the one other thing to consider is that the co-founder of the BDS campaign has been very, very clear about what he sees as the end goal. And the end goal is not a two-state solution. The end goal is the destruction of Israel as a state, its replacement with a state in which Jews are a minority. And given that we have seen in the last 50, 60 years exactly what happens to every single other Jewish community in the Middle East, which was a minority, I think that the Jewish community, both here and elsewhere, are right to be profoundly concerned by that. 
Thank you. One more question. Uh, clause 4 prohibits statements of intent to boycott. Do you agree that this is a necessary addition to the bill? And just one further other question, just on the enforcement regime. Do you think the enforcement regime is necessary here? Sure. Uh, so on clause 4, as I said, this is something that we've seen now over the course of several years in terms of uh, BDS in public bodies. And often, while the results do have an impact on the Jewish community, uh, that impact isn't limited to the actual implementation of BDS. That is part of these public bodies. Um, having, it's part of the free bar nature of that debate, bringing that debate into our public bodies, once again, specifically with the point being that it tends to be the only foreign policy that has that debate in, in our public bodies in this country. And therefore, I understand the purpose of that clause and uh, definitely see, uh, see the need for something to that extent. Uh, in terms of the enforcement powers, absolutely this, this bill would have uh, little merit without having adequate enforcement powers. It would, it would leave it to, similar to a situation where we are now when it comes to ind individual campaigners to raise this through judicial review and, and so on and therefore one of the key parts of this bill is having uh, proper enforcement powers to ensure that this bill is enforced. Before I bring in another member, could I, I think it's been partly answered, but I'd like to see if we can get a clearer answer. Is there a distinction in, in terms of the provisions of the bill, is there a distinction to be made between um, questioning the rights of the State of Israel to exist on the one hand, and on the other hand, being free to criticise the actions of, of the Israeli government at any given moment in time? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I'm tempted to give you the one word answer, uh, but it's a, a, absolutely, there's no issue here in terms of criticising Israel. The UK should have robust foreign policy on all issues, including Israel, and I don't think anything should get in the way of that. But what we have seen is a problematic picture where the only uh, time, only country which any public body seeks to wish to criticise tends to be the one Jewish state in the world, and that I have an issue with. But I'm not getting in the way of anyone here criticising Israel, should you wish to do so. Thanks, that's very helpful. Chris Stevens. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just following up on that, because that was going to be my first question, so I'll ask my second question. Thanks, Chair. Um, there's obviously a debate about this bill, including within the Jewish community. Um, and we have some representatives of the Jewish community who are going to put to us uh, their view of the bill that it restricts freedom of expression rather than directly addressing the issue of anti-Semitism. So I presume, I, I presume that both of you disagree with that, so would you tell us why you disagree with other uh, Jewish representatives who are going to be giving evidence to this kind of Sure. Um, well, firstly, I, I would say that we, we don't believe that it prevents freedom of expression in that any individual will still have the absolute right and any private organisation will have the absolute right not only to um, adopt a BDS uh, motion or, or to carry forward the idea of BDS. We are essentially concerned that public bodies that are being, you know, receive public funding, are being used to promote a, a foreign policy agenda which is different from His Majesty's government. Uh, and we, we find that extremely troubling. And the, the idea that it's, it's a freedom of speech issue, I think to our, us both, I can't speak for you, it just, just appears to be extremely misleading. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, the Jewish community. No, neither of us will claim the Jewish community is a homogenous community that will uh, agree a single position on any piece of legislation, let alone this one. Uh, but we we both sit here as representatives of uh, national representative bodies. Um, this is a position that uh, we've considered and come to. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else? Steve. Kim, let this. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, witnesses, for joining us this morning. I, like all my colleagues, abhor anti-Semitism um, and agree that if further measures are needed to eradicate it from public life, of course, we will support them. But is there not a risk that by this bill very publicly singling out the State of Israel as a special case, it may actually provoke greater anti-Semitism, the very thing that none of us want to see? Uh, okay. I've heard this argument, and I think it's 
really important um, that it gets a clear answer, and that is anti-Semitism is not a response to government legislation. It's not a criticism of the Israeli government. Anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews, and I'm really cautious of any arguments that this piece of legislation would increase anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it, the, I, I think it's an argument that we really need to steer clear of. I would add to that that from from our point of view, the reason why it is right that Israel is singled out here is because, as far as I am aware, Israel is the only country that is regularly targeted for such boycotts via public bodies. No other country is targeted in such a manner. And therefore it seems correct that there be some acknowledgement of that and some, uh, some way to ensure that that doesn't happen. And you don't have any concerns that this bill could have a negative impact on communities within the UK? I, 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 think it, I, I think it will have a positive impact on communities here in the UK. Unfortunately, what we see here in the UK, and it happens with other foreign issues, but specifically with the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, is we see a foreign conflict here affecting inter-community relations here in the UK. And worst of all, we then see public bodies, some public bodies, it's a minority, but some public bodies, seeking to then get involved in that debate and make those tensions worse when I think they should be getting involved to make those tensions, to improve the situation. So I completely agree with you, but I, I think come to a different point. I think that uh, it will certainly make things better for Jewish communities, particularly small Jewish communities who have been in positions where they sometimes feel that unless they vocally criticise Israel as Jews, they will not get a hearing. And I... I admit I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for people who might feel that they no longer have the means to make such Jewish communities feel uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve McKay. Thank you. Morning. Um, when I first heard about the, the government's intentions to legislate in this area, I understood it to be legislation to prevent public bodies <coughs> boycotting the State of Israel, which I welcome. Um, and I just wonder whether you think the government's made life easier or more difficult for itself by extending the range and scope of the bill, or whether we would have been better to have concentrated on preventing the boycott of the State of Israel. I think that's an excellent point, um, but I think that had the government focused specifically on Israel um, and not on anything else, then we would have seen some of the same people who are raising que um, questions in general and well-meaning questions as to why Israel is singled out specifically in this bill. I think that the questions as to why only Israel was being focused on would have been a thousand times louder. So I think it makes sense that the government has uh, put a wider scope for this while uh, singling out Israel within the wider bill. I, I would add to that that it, it's also part of our reasoning to believe that public bodies shouldn't be boycotting Israel is that it contributes UK government policy and that this is a foreign policy issue uh, being taken up by public bodies. Uh, and therefore I can understand the wider scope to tie that into that national picture of public bodies not taking foreign policy decisions contrary to national government. Thank you. Um, are there any fur fur further lines of questioning? We have time available. Anybody wishes to pursue? No? In which case, um, although we didn't take up a lot of your time, um, I think it gave members of the committee an opportunity to err uh, some of the points of principle as they're presented um, and to look at alternative points of view on it and that's been really really helpful and of course you bring a, a perspective to this that is very focused on one specific community but that's as it should be so we're very grateful um, for the light you've been able to shine on some of those difficult issues that I know people are trying to cope with uh, by being even-handed and but also um, operating on good, so solid principles. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much for inviting us.